The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Hello, I'm Jerry Renault. Today on Live and Learn, we want to talk to you about a sport that is sweeping the nation. It's pickleball. It's a great sport, something you can go out and enjoy for long periods of time and as you get a little older and it gives you great exercise and it's also a great way to hang out with family and friends. We have some really fun people to help explain how that is going to work today. One of them, Lincoln Tennis Pro Sig Garnet. You won't want to miss it. I'm Lita Powell Drake and today we're going to take a tour of Waiuka Cemetery. How long has it been since you've been to Waiuka Cemetery? You're going to love to hear the details with Diane Bartles and Ed Zimmer. And as we tour our great and wonderful Waiuka Cemetery. Hi everybody, I'm Kim Hachia. Welcome to this segment of Live and Learn. My guest today is going to be Jason the Bird Nerd from Spring Creek Prairie Audubon Center. It's just a fabulous little gem of a natural resource that's 30 minutes from downtown Lincoln. Everybody should go see it. It's just really a beautiful way to connect with nature. I think you're going to enjoy the segment. Stay with us. I'm Doug Jones. Today I'm going to visit with Jim Gustafson from the Nebraska Community Foundation and we're going to discuss the new tax bill and the implications for charitable giving. Stay tuned. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. Today, as you can tell, we have moved out of the studio and we've moved to Peterson Park, where you can see behind me a number of people playing pickleball. Pickleball, one of the hottest growing sports across the country, and we think it's a great way for you to get out and get some physical fitness and also have a really good time with family and friends and make lots of new friends. So we're going to show you a little bit how to play pickleball today and we have several people that are joining us that are going to help in this endeavor and the first person is longtime Lincoln Tennis Pro Sig Garnet. Sig, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Jerry. We are both longtime tennis players as are uh, the folks that are also going to be playing with us today mm -hmm. but um, we loved playing tennis. Sometimes when you get a little older there are some injuries and ailments and things that tend to get in the way. Pickleball is a great alternative. Yes, for me I've had uh, two total knee replacements so pickleball is a great game for me. Yeah, and I've had some issues with my foot so uh, so it really is, we were both surprised uh, at how much actual physical activity yeah, there is very, as a part of that. It's a good workout. It's a good workout. Not it is a good workout and you can take a lot of the tennis skills that you had uh, and you had some ping pong skills as well to bring to the court. Yeah, anything you ever did with a racket, you're going to be able to use it in pickleball. Pickleball Excellent. is definitely a very challenging racket sport and it will keep your mind and your body busy. Perfect. Sig, thanks for helping us out is, today. Shot making is the mind part and getting to the ball is the body part. Right, right. <laughs> and that's the biggest challenge. Yeah, yeah, it's fun though. It's fun. Excellent. Thanks, thanks Sig. Jerry. Okay, joining us also today is going to be Bill Rears. Bill is a longtime uh, tennis player and also very, very involved in pickleball here in the city. Bill, thanks for being with us. This is a great sport. Thank you, Jerry. We really enjoy pickleball uh, because of the fun, the fun that people have when they're playing it. Uh, we get a lot of people freshly retired looking for ways to fill their time and get exercise that's fun for them. And as we're going to show them a little bit, it's real easy to get started. It is very easy to get started. We give free lessons and uh, we just want the people to experience the sport and see if, 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 it fit, if it's a fit for them. Perfect. All right, and our fourth person today is going to be Jane Check. Jane is a former tennis player, uh, and she is the person who helps coordinate uh, lots of the pickleball activities as well. Jane, thanks for being with us. Thank you. All right, uh, let's let's get started. Uh, pickleball, as as Bill mentioned, is a is a fairly easy thing to get going and to get started. So we're going to go on over to the courts, and we'll show you just how easy it is. All right, so we are here on the courts now. We want to talk a little bit about getting started. Bill has generously agreed to uh, put a microphone on and come and come talk to us. So let's talk about the equipment. Um, uh, lots of times people will think, oh, it's expensive. I, I can't spend that kind of money to go out and get started. But it's really a, a pretty basic sort of thing. I mean, you can get started. I have a very inexpensive racket, and you can get a couple of them and uh, one of our little balls for mm -hmm. about 20 bucks. You can spend a lot more money on that as well. But, but it's not too bad to get it started. Mm -hmm. uh, equipment has evolved from wood paddles, which one this is. Yep. And that's the way it started 65 years ago, 52 years ago, excuse me. And uh, 
uh, they, the, the equipment's getting better and better as the sport is expanding. Uh, we have paddles that people can use here, uh, and, and there are places in town that will loan them out to you also, as you're just testing to see if this sport is for you. Our, our basic motto here is, like a lot of sports places, is fun, fitness, and friendship. And as we get older, our circle of friends tends to get a little bit smaller, and you join a place like this, and all of a sudden, you've got four or 500 new friends. And we all have fun here, um, and they've been very, very nice to help others teach the game to other people, and it's been a, 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 a lot of fun to uh, work with this sport. Fabulous. Okay, so you need a small paddle like this one, and we need a ball that's sort of like a wiffle ball. Is mm -hmm. that how you describe it? That's exactly what it is, the wiffle ball. There's different kinds, but your basic ball will get you back and forth. Just to hit the ball back and forth, it helps to have a little bit of, of racket sport experience, but the mo there are a lot of people that I've taught that have never done a racket sport and have enjoyed the physical activity and just hitting the ball back and forth. It You'll hear laughter a lot out on the court here. As long as we don't hear any cursing today, I'll be happy. Okay, yep, okay we so we have our equipment, we have our paddles, we have a ball. Now, getting started. Um, our, our basic concept is encouragement for folks to come out and have some fun. Mm -hmm. If they want to be competitive, they can, but we're really just looking to have a little fun. What is your recommendation for us just getting started here if somebody is just coming out? We give free lessons Monday, Wednesday, Friday and uh, usually we get four people together and the first thing we talk about is safety because I've had people who have come out uh, and, and injured themselves the first time. Uh, you, you have to remember that when you're 60, if your body is a lot different than when you're 35 and you wanna not go for the ball too much, you wanna be careful not to injure yourself. In our lessons, we the first 10 to 15 minutes, we talk about safety, uh, the things to do so you don't injure yourself. Okay, very good. All right, so we've been through that. We're, we're, we're safety conscious. Now we just want to hit a few things and, and get started. So let's just go out and have a little fun and show them just a quick little exercise okay. that they can do for us to get started. And we have Jane and Sig back here and we'll stop right. them in just a second. Jane, okay, Jane Oops. and Sig, come on up here. Uh, what we're going to do now is uh, we kind of basically find out how the people are, what kind of sports people they are, uh, but we do what they call dinking. And we're going to hit the ball back and forth, and all the object is here is to lift the ball into the other green area. And then you try to hit it back. And the object here is just to hit it back and forth and not have to hit hard. You'd be surprised the number of people who have succeeded at this, and is, this is more fun than they've had in a long time. And as a senior citizen who used to walk a lot, this is a lot of fun compared to just walking. And mixing up, we have a lot of people that have a variety of exercise that they do. Some of them will, some of them will uh, do bicycle riding, some will try to play some tennis, they'll mix it up with golf, but they, a lot of them come back two, three times a week. After we've dinked, then we ask the people to back up about to half court, and we're going to, you, you got the ball, don't you, Jerry? Yep. Okay, and just hit it back to us. This isn't trying to hit a long, hard one. We just want to get it back and forth. Right, again, we're just looking to have fun at this point, right? Yep. Just to get the ball back and forth. All right. I don't know. I think now, one of the differences between tennis and uh, pickleball is tennis players tend to hit the ball like this, fairly close to the net. Yeah. Pickleball players, you want to elevate the ball and get it in more of an arc, trying to keep the other players back. But right now, we're just getting the ball over. Let's see if we can get it over five times in a row. There's two, three, four, five. Six. This could go on a long time. And when we do, we um, ask the people, number one thing they want to do, like in any sport, is to keep their eye on the ball. And once they keep their eye on the ball, it's amazing how many times they can get the ball back and forth. So this is the basic thing. 
Uh, once we get that, then we're going to back up all the way to the baseline, and this is sort of like a tennis game now. We're just going to hit the ball back and forth. And some people will take, have a little more trouble here, but it doesn't take long. And then, once they get those skills down, it's about 20 minutes to a half hour of instruction, and then we're ready to talk about playing the game. Okay. Is that a good segue to... That's a great segue. Okay. Let's talk about uh, at least getting started. Now, okay. We, we wanted to stay a little bit away from scoring because mm -hmm. it's kind of confusing, mm -hmm. but let's at least talk about how you get the serve in, how you have to have the two bounce rule, mm -hmm. how we're going to get started in that fashion. So one of the differences is this area called the kitchen. You, in, in tennis, after you've served, you, the object is to get as close to the net as you can sure. so you can put the ball away. So the as Bryan the, Twins wouldn't be able to play this game. Uh, well, they, <laughs> the they actually be great at anything they, they wanted to do. Yeah. Anyway, they have, uh, so th this kitchen, after I serve it, uh, the object is both teams have to get together here to try to hit, get into a dink game. So the serve is an underhand serve, which and it I has will do to, now. It has to, be it has to go the... diagonally into that court, and I, I toss the ball in the air, and then I hit through it, okay? And All then right. it has to bounce again. It has to bounce a second time, and now, um, okay, so I'm just gonna try it again. And that's the way tennis players will play. Okay, let's try it again. Because beginners won't have that kind of control just yet. But now sometimes, you have to practice that shot, Sig. Sometimes that's called a, a drop shot, a third shot drop, and it drops into the kitchen and even you can't reach and get it. You have to let it bounce. You have to let it bounce. Mm -hmm. Unless it bounces. Once but it, it has, bounces. To, has to bounce twice after the serve, then you can take it out of the air yes. if you want. Mm -hmm. Right. And you can step into the kitchen to hit the ball after it's bounced, correct. correct. Mm -hmm. And you can stand in the kitchen just as long as you don't touch the ball. That's not a violation. Right. So it's once just... you've hit it, then you need to step back out. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you have to have both feet behind the line to serve the ball, correct? I'm sorry? You have to start with both feet behind the correct. line. And with, it's, if it's you're just going like to tennis. Serve. You have to be within the confines. In order to score a point, you have to be serving. Yes. You okay. cannot serve if you're receiving. Right. You cannot score if you're receiving. Ah. And when we hit the ball, let's, let's just play a point now. The two bounce rule. That, that's okay. All right, that's right. Um, Does so he have to hit the second shot back to him, though? Right, so the bounce is irrelevant to you. I the second shot back to him. Right, here we go. Okay, now he serves it to you. So yes. now the score is 1 0. And. Uh, this is where tennis players, the very typical tennis player shot, hits the net. The net is your friend. And so you want to hit it maybe this high, making us hit it back. If it does hit the net, it bounces in. It's called the Bill North in. philosophy of sports. I've been doing this in tennis for 30 years. And yeah. <laughs> All right. So here we go. When you do connect with it, though, it's pretty good. Yeah. Let's try that one again. All right. Eye on the ball. I got to get to it. Up. Play it. One See, more I'm time. Too much like I'm too much playing tennis. Start out almost to the fence, all the way back. No, I can't get that far up. I can hit that top of that line really good. Next time, aim up here. Oh, sing. 
I'm in the kitchen. Yeah, he's I'm in the kitchen. So there's a there's a point. Stay out of the kitchen. Play pickleball. Oh. <laughs> I knew that before it hit the shot. Like, oh, no, it's let, hard let to me stop another yourself. one to sing. Good. It was beautiful. <laughs> it was. Form was perfect. See, that's why you don't want to hit it up in the air. Mm -hmm. right, exactly. that's so, why you, you so if you're hitting the ball the up kitchen. in the air this high, but somebody's going to do that. Yeah, but um, when you're at the kitchen like this, the object is to drop it into the kitchens to make them hit up on it. If you hit it too, on your ground strokes, get it over the net. And then see what else happens. Here we go again. Uh-oh, thank you. All right. And that's how I want to play. Okay. Sig, Sig you want to know how to make Jerry mad? <laughs> Out. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. When um, I lose the serve, then you guys serve. Then it, then it comes to us. And, and the, it's... But on the first rotation... First rotation. That, you're right. the only one who serves. And Just then it comes the to us. And, and then you, we both, both serve. And then when it comes to us, and then, we both then you would both serve again, and yeah. you only get points when you're serving. Correct. And the team to 11, mm -hmm. winning by two, mm -hmm. wins the game. Yes. And sometimes if you go to tournaments, you play to 15 in the losers bracket. Okay. Very good. All right. All right. Everything you need there. Everything we need. Everything you need to learn how to play pickleball. Fabulous. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Sig. Thank you all for tuning in. Appreciate it very much. Because remember. It's never too late to live and learn. Lincoln Cares is a community donation program that provides extra funds for our city, parks, library, and services for our older adults. Like these great pickleball courts at Peterson Park. You can help support more projects like this on our community. Just sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month by signing up at lincolncares.info if you're already on board, thank you. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Lita Powell Drake, and we have something very special for you today. And I want to ask you a question. How long has it been since you visited Wyuka Cemetery? It's extraordinary. And we have two of the professionals to be with us today to tell you some of the history of the story. Uh, Diane Bartles, who is president of the Wyuka Historical Foundation. And of course, Ed Zimmer, <laughs> who knows a little bit about a lot of things right here. Historic preservation planner. And uh, you're, he's going to be taking us on a walking tour. So I want you to mark this uh, date down so that you'll be able to come out and see and hear him talk about all those wonderful graves. It's starting on October the 7th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, you offer this tour many times during the year to any group that wants it, Ed. If I can arrange it, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Depending upon your time and your schedule. Now, the, the name Wayuka, it's kind of an odd name. What, what's the origin of that? It really goes back to Wayuka Cemetery in Nebraska City that had a Wayuka Cemetery before Lincoln's. But the, the derivation is at least based loosely on a Native American uh, term, meaning he lies down or he reclines, oh. probably in the Oto language, sometimes oh. said to be in the Lakota language. It's not exact, it's an English speaker <laughs> coming up with a version that sounds something like a native word. We kind of change things a little bit, don't we, to suit <laughs> our but, pleasure but or, or Nebraska spelling. Nebraska City got there first. <laughs> How old is Wyuka Cemetery? How long has it been around? Our Wyuka Cemetery in Lincoln is 1869. The legislature created it by an act at that time. An act of God? An act of the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> How many acres are out at Wayuka Cemetery? About 150 acres between O and Vine Street. Wow, 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 150 acres. And uh, how many people can you guesstimate that are buried there? I know it's over 50,000. I get reports as many as 70,000, somewhere in that range. It's in a Nebra among Nebraska cities, it's a very large one. C could it be full uh, soon or 
because they can't expand. There, there are many different styles of burial, uh, and I think it's hard to even put a timeline on a cemetery because it depends on what style of burial families choose. But I mean, there still is space there's still out is there. There's still space, very mm -hmm. much, very much so. Because I know it's limited by, you know, there's a roadway there, O Street is mm -hmm. on one side, and Vine Street's on the other side, there's so I just wondered how far it could actually There's continue. quite a lot of space available still. That, that hasn't been used yet. So when our time comes, <laughs> there'll, there'll, be, there'll, there'll be room at the end. <laughs> the choice, it's a choice we can make. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a look at some of the, the significant monuments that are out at uh, Wayuka Cemetery. And we're going to start with somebody who lived in Lincoln for a while. We're going to start with Gordon McRae, of course. Uh, and if you look at the, at the, at the uh, gravestone, you see on the top of Gordon's, do you see, you see those little musical notes over there on the right-hand side? You see the little notes? And you know what those notes say? I love this. Oh, what a beautiful morning. <laughs> that's what Gordon had put on his gravestone. I think that's absolutely amazing. Tell us a little bit about that particular grave, would you? Well, that one's n near the O Street side. Mm -hmm. uh, we often go by it on the tours. Um, Gordon and his wife buried side by side. It also quite remarkably has at the base an epitaph from Ronald Reagan. Um, we won't have another of those at the cemetery. This is Gordon. On his? On his? It says Gordon will always be remembered whenever beautiful music is heard. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, so what a beautiful day. But Gordon retired to Lincoln, uh, lived here the last years of his life. It was his um, wife's home ground. Yeah. Uh, lived down at Bishop Square and I guess often stepped out on his front step in the morning and mm -hmm. sang. Mm -hmm. um, he al also sang the national anthem yeah. at the football games. Uh -huh. Yeah, and when the wind comes sweeping down the plains, I can remember him so clearly in the movie singing that. That was very special. We'll look at another grave right now, the firefighter's grave. And this has an interesting tie here in Lincoln with the Belmont School. Yes. What yes. is that? Well, Wayuka Historical Foundation, every year for several years, I don't have the exact number, but they bring their fifth graders who are graduating from elementary school out to Wayuka for a historic tour and a wetlands tour. And then we also feed them lunch. And this monument, the firefighters monument, years ago, the Belmont classes raised money to have a brick engraved with each of the grade levels. I think it went up to sixth grade at that point. And, uh, and so that's a very special stop on the historic tour for those graduating fifth graders from Belmont. Well, I saw you in the spring do a tour, and I was so impressed. Well, thank you. Because I hadn't seen, I know that you, you're brilliant, and how you can <laughs> store all that stuff in your brain. I mean, you, the information that he's collected in his brain is really amazing. So uh, we did take a look at that particular picture, so you get the idea. Uh, that, you know, the turnout is very good, and remember, it's all free, and people love to hear this background, all the things going on. And one thing I like about you is you use your microphone so everybody can hear you very, very easily. And uh, are there any restraints on people coming out there? We pretty much make the tour work for whatever group we get. Sometimes we have a dozen people, sometimes we have a hundred or more. Um, I carry a bullhorn so that I don't have to scream at people because mm -hmm. I'm not a good screamer. Um, if necessary, we sometimes even have a second speaker towards the back to give them a little bit of surround sound. We, if, if people are able, we walk over the streets and the grass. That's what I wanted to ask you about. What about a wheelchair, if someone were in a wheelchair? We, we would accommodate oh. what we had. We, we might not go across the grass if we had a, a wheelchair um, patron along, but we, we would make it work. So. And of course, you have always have to consider dress for the weather because we never know what it is. It will always be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what if it starts to rain or something? What, how do you call it off or, or what? If, 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 if it were uh, a lightning storm and we thought it was dangerous for people, we wouldn't take them out. But we've been out in sprinkles, mm -hmm. we've been out in inclement weather, we've been out under umbrellas occasionally. Mm -hmm. So How long have you been doing this, Ed? I think we, I've been giving tours at Waikuk, I think, for about 20 years. Mm. So you're going to keep doing it until you get it right? Yes, he is. <laughs> I mean, not the right, but he's going to keep doing I, it. I don't know if I can do it that long, <laughs> but, but I'll keep doing it, trying to get it right. 
People ask me if I'm going to give the same tour again, and I can't remember which one I've given, so <laughs> we well, go out and walk around and talk. Yeah, what's amazing is how much information you have in your brain, because when I saw you, you're not using notes or anything, and you can tell all the details in the background of this particular person or, or family that died, and I say, how can you... There's this advantage. There are names and dates written right on the <laughs> stone. So, so it's, I, 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 my crib sheets are there in granite. And he's modest, too. <laughs> now, Diane Bartles is a licensed pilot. In fact, she and I got to fly in the all-women's transcontinental air race well, all across the United States a couple of times. And that was, a, that was, re that was, was really great. the first time I met you, mm -hmm. I think. That's true. And, and here we are, <laughs> these many years later, still. <laughs> We're still here. <laughs> We're still here. We're not dead yet. <laughs> now, there is a unique grave, the Sloninger grave. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could tell us a little bit of the background of this, yeah. this yeah. particular. Well, it's, it's my, one of my missions in life is to make sure the early day pioneers that have a connection to Nebraska that are aviation minded ha have a uh, become known. And so uh, Ira Schloniger, who uh, was from Nebraska, was one of the pioneers during the golden age of aviation, which is the 1920s and 30s. And he was a stunt pilot. He barnstormed. Uh, he was a test pilot. He flew the airmail. And then when the commercial airline industry looked like it was going to go, he signed on with, a, uh, with an industry, a company, that ultimately became American Airlines, which we're oh, all familiar with. Yeah. And he was the number one pilot, so they all they called him old number one. He had like 25,000 hours of flight time oh. in his logbook. And then last January, we inducted him into the Nebraska Aviation Hall of Fame. Oh, that's and beautiful. he's buried there with his wife, yeah. Catherine. Okay. And of course, uh, somebody else, the Charlie Stark Weather Grave is out at Wyuka Cemetery. He was born in 1938 and was executed in 1959. And uh, several movies actually have come out of this. Badlands, uh, Born Bad, and A Natural Born Killer. You, you were able to, to show us where it was. I'm, I'm often asked to take people by the Starkweather grave. Whenever I'm asked that, I always pause and remember that five of his victims are buried at Wayuka, the Wards and the Bartlett families. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think we ever should talk about Charlie without acknowledging his victims. Yeah, and, and compared to Charlie Starkweather, we also have uh, some, of the, some of the greats in Lincoln, like James Exon. Uh, there's a beautiful monument for him. And he was, of course, governor here of Nebraska from 1971 to 79, senator. And he passed away not that long ago. Waiuka, I, I think of it as a living cemetery, which may sound contradictory, but it's still an active cemetery. There are, there are new burials every year, mm -hmm. every, every week. Mm -hmm. um, and about a dozen of Lincoln's mayors and about a dozen of Nebraska's governors are buried. So mm -hmm. Exxon joins a distinguished list yeah. um, of notables at Waiuka. And Diane, tell us about the Grand Army of the Republic. Oh, that is the organization that was formed for the Union soldiers from Nebraska that uh, fought in the Civil, Civil War. And uh, uh, the legislature in uh, 1892 decreed that there should be a special area in Wyuka for these Union veterans, uh, members of the Grand Army of the Republic. And so the photo you see is a photo is of that. And in the center of these concentric circles is a statue of a Union soldier. Uh, 265 are buried in the Grand Army of the Republic. I love the rotation of it. I mean, those circles are really beautiful. beautiful. The really neat thing that I, I like, and I don't know if I'm exactly correct, but the monuments I have looked at, there's not a birth or a death date. There's the name, and then there's also uh, the regiment from which they oh. served during the Civil War. And what is really cool to me is that all these people from the eastern states, these former soldiers, they came out here to make a living in Nebraska. And of course, they are probably right as there. farmers. Probably to farm. farm well, land. one of the African Americans, uh, the one who was uh, portrayed on Glory, uh, oh. James Bush, he was a porter on one of our railroads here. Ah. That was his his work. Okay. <laughs> and of course, a special place out at Wyuka is the Swan Theater, and it really was an old barn for the horses at one particular time. But it was <laughs> rehabbed. I'm happy to say, in 2014. And it was named for 
what? Why is it called the Swan Theater, Ed? I call it the Stables. Oh, you still call it the Stables? Well, it's the Stables when it's not being used yeah. as a theater. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Swan, I think, is a reference both to the swans on the pond yeah. right beside it, and it's the kind of name that Shakespearean theaters had of the rose. Or the or the swan the, Theater. And there yeah. was a swan. Yeah. And it's been used for some of the summer Shakespearean productions, and so I think Swan is a great name for it as a theater. Yeah, well, I know it was originally a barn. So uh, what did they use the horses for, Diane? Uh, horsepower. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh they, di good, good, they didn't. Good. They didn't have four-wheeled vehicles. They had, you know, four-wheeled horses, <laughs> and so you know they took the caskets to the like the receiving vault when it was too cold for the ground to be dug for a burial mm -hmm. until they, you know it was spring, and then they also went down apparently downtown. They called it because Wayuka Cemetery was kind of like on the outskirts. They, according to a newspaper article, they went downtown and they picked up like monuments and caskets and other kinds of supplies. So, so it really was a workhorse. Okay, and one last thing we want to talk about, of course, is the placing of the wreaths across America. Okay. That is done every uh, year uh, in December. This year it's December 15th at 11 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and people are welcome to come out and make a donation uh, prior or and they can also place wreaths. Uh, we, we have put over 1,600 wreaths on military graves in the past few years. This is our ninth year ah. that we will be doing this. Excellent. Yes. And just a reminder that Ed's going to have a tour coming up, so put this down on your calendar. It, it is going to be on October 7th, that's a Sunday at two o'clock in the afternoon. And of course, Wayuka is located at 3600 O Street. Just meet at the Rudge Chapel at Wayuka. And then once Ed gets everybody organized and got his microphone going, <laughs> then you take off and walk and, and he'll tell you some wonderful stories. Our thanks to Ed Zimmer, uh, preservation planner for Lincoln, and, and of course to Diane Bartles from Wayuka Cemetery. Remember, it's never too late to live and learn about the wonderful history of Lincoln, Nebraska and Wyuga Cemetery. Vulnerable and senior adults might be living in silent fear of elder abuse and financial exploitation. We can do something about it. The Nebraska DHHS recommends that communities maintain and improve resources such as public transportation and senior centers to prevent social isolation. Engage professionals in various disciplines to find solutions to end elder abuse. Every year, June 15 is observed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an opportunity to ensure justice for all. Hi everybody, my name is Kim Hachio. Welcome to Live and Learn. You know, Lincoln, Nebraska is home to just a real gem of a resource, Spring Creek Prairie Audubon Center, which is located just minutes southwest of Lincoln. It's a remnant of tall grass prairie and it welcomes visitors of all ages who want to connect with nature. My guest today is Jason Sansever. He is the better known perhaps as the bird nerd. <laughs> and he is director of education and outreach for Audubon, Nebraska. And welcome to the show, Jason. Thank you very much for having me. This is exciting. Thanks, I'm excited too, because uh, I love Spring Creek Prairie. It's just such a cool place. Tell me about what it is, kind of a, a little bit about its history and what do you guys do out there? Sure, so we are basically an 850 acre Tall Grass Prairie Nature Preserve, a uh, little nature center out there. We're part of the National Audubon Society, which is a big network of bird-themed conservation organizations. Um, there are 41 centers like us across the country, um, and we are lucky to have two right here in Nebraska, Spring Creek Prairie Audubon Center, just south of Denton there, and uh, Rowe Sanctuary, which is out in near Kearney along the Platte River. Um, we have all kinds of tall grass prairie that has never been broken, which is why it was purchased by Audubon back in 1998. And then it's basically a place to come and enjoy nature, to really connect with it in any way, um, and in many ways for all ages. So. so what are some of the programs that you have out there? Our biggest program is especially field trips for kids. We do a lot. We probably see between four to 5,000 uh, elementary age students and then other students as well. Um, Pre-K with daycare and all the way up through high school and college research projects. Um, Prairie Immersion is our biggest, which is coming up this fall. The fourth graders in Nebraska all need to learn about um, Nebraska prairie and history. And so they come out and explore our wagon ruts from the Oregon Trail that cross the property, as well as just get really immersed. They like crawl through the plants and catch bugs. It's a lot of fun. 
So um, when you talk about, I, I've always thought of Audubon as being a bird, it's a bird thing. It is. So what makes it, what makes Spring Creek so interesting is it's more than birds, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Our uh, mission tagline for Audubon across the country is protect birds and you protect the earth. So what we do is birds are our main theme, right? Helping our bird and our feathered friends. But by doing that, you're really protecting the habitats they need and all the other plants and wildlife that depend on that habitat as well. So for example, at Spring Creek Prairie specifically, we have prairie chicken. And by protecting all of the habitats they need through their life cycle, pretty much everything else from bobcat and regal fritillary butterflies are all protected and have a great place to live as well. So if it's a protected site, why do you want people to walk around in it? Doesn't that bother you? Doesn't that bother the little animals and all those things? That's a really great question. We're lucky enough because we have a big enough parcel and around us as well, a prairie complex outside of our boundary where the habitat and the uh, species can move a lot. So we have sort of zones of disturbance. It was historically an amazing ranch by the O'Brien family, um, just horse and cattle. They had never plowed and planted. So the native grasses are all still there. Um, so the area right around where the farmstead always was is always going to be a little more disturbed. So that's where we have our big public programs like our fall festival that can bring out sometimes three to 500 people. Mm -hmm. As you get further out from the center, then it's a little bit more pristine, but we still want people, we need people these days to connect with nature and really help it, to care about it. Um, so we know that we've got to invite them out to walk a trail. Our trails are unbounded. You can get off and explore and really check out that beautiful flower you see or that really cool Katie did that's jumping through the grass, right? And explore those. So we want people to like experience that. If they don't, especially our youth these days, that's not happening. So we need to have that resource that they can explore and connect with. So if people, I love the idea that there's this little bit of wildness just so close to the city. Yeah. And um, I, I just think, I do think it's important that people still connect with that because it maybe helps open your mind to different things. You talked about birds being kind of a sentinel species for the ecology. Talk, tell me a little bit about that concept. Yeah, other than frogs and amphibians, which are extremely sensitive, birds are one of the best indicator species. They're called where they're the first that we notice where if something is going wrong in the ecosystem. So that's one of the reasons Audubon focuses on them is they can really tell us a lot, especially right now with climate change. They're telling us a lot of what they will or will not be able to adapt to and what we need to do to try to fix that. Um, so that's why we're protecting them there, but there's a lot more to it than that too, so. So how many, you told me once that there's over 200 species of birds have been, have been seen out there. What are, if I was to go out there say today and I realize every day is different, it is, but yeah. if I was to go to her now, we're just getting into the fall season, what might we expect to see out there? Yeah, right now fall migration has just started. So it's actually kind of heating up again. In the heat of the summer, the birds are really focusing on breeding, so they're, you know, feeding the little ones. So there's maybe not as much activity to see. Right now it's getting exciting again. We've got brown thrashers. Uh, on the screen you can see there's a grasshopper sparrow. That's one of our specialty species. It's a species in decline because they need grasslands like tall grass prairie that we have out there. There's only about 2% of that left in Nebraska and nationwide. So that's another reason that we're lucky to have that parcel out there. Um, bobolinks, thrashers, um, like I said, sometimes in the fall is a good time to try to scare up a prairie chicken out there on a walk. Um, we also have hawks migrating over, swallows and swifts. Like, it's pretty exciting. Right, and I, I've been there before, full disclosure. So I know that there's, you know, there's a pond, there's a creek, mm -hmm. you know, there's the hillside and all that. So there's sort of a quite a varied sort of geography, I guess, you yeah. know. So you, you would see different things like waterfowl perhaps and other things that are yeah, when the center around. was first purchased, um, they had to make a few decisions, and I love the way they planned and, and kind of figured out what they wanted to do with the center, which was the prairie is the most important part because having a 600 or more acre area of tall grass prairie was really rare. Mm -hmm. But we also have Wachiska Woods, our local uh, Audubon chapter, helped us um, get that portion. So we have a riparian area with trees along the creek um, as a habitat. We have a pond that was there to water the horse and cattle, but that wetland area is great for shorebirds and waterfowl coming through in the spring and fall. So to have those, it's also an amazing educational tool to have those different habitats to both compare and to explore with different ages. 
So, so you, you talked about programs for fourth graders, yep. but are there programs that are more geared towards non-fourth graders, or how? What what could I expect somebody somebody in our age group might? find out there. Absolutely. So one of the easiest is our trails and they're the most popular. They are open sunrise to sunset as well. So even if our visitor center isn't open, which is nine to five weekdays and one to five on the weekends, you can walk right around the building and go walk on those trolls, ev trails every day of the year from sunrise to sunset. Um, and we even, we don't usually advertise this too much, but if the, like the Perseids were just happening, right? If you want to come out and see the moon or some beautiful meteor shower, just let us know ahead of time and we can give you permission to come in in the evening with a picnic blanket and it's a great place to get away from city lights and see a lot of uh, great things like that. So the trails are a big thing but we have um, a uh, program called our salon series which is adult workshops. We do some on art, on gardening, on wildscaping which is eating edible plants from the prairie. All of these great ideas and we try to do at least one program a month for the public of all different ages so there's a lot to do. So is there a cost to go out there? Is it there is. There's a usual admission fee of $3 for kids and students and then uh, $4 for adults. Um, there's a discount for National Audubon members and there is free every Tuesday. So every Tuesday throughout the year is free admission day. I have to admit that sometimes when I've been out there I've probably not paid the admission fee oh, because I just... We don't. I just go out on the trail and you, the, <laughs> the building isn't open. But and we'd rather have people do that anyway, so yeah, that's cool. It's, it, it is a pretty magical place and it kind of no matter what time you go there's something interesting. Are the trails handicapped accessible or how does that work? That's a great question. So right near the uh, building they are accessible. They're not fully ADA compliant. There's some areas. We have a great project in the works to get those fixed. A large section of our trails to be completely compliant right around the center. Um, so we're working on that. But right around, they are um, crushed granite, so they mm -hmm. are pretty good. Um, and then once you get out of that first kind of zone across one bridge and uh, out towards the um, bigger prairie, they are just mowed grass. So right. depending then, on someone's ability, they right, can be a little tough. Right. So would you, I would not consider it to be a strenuous hike, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's just, it's a, it's a walkable very walkable and very interesting and so do you want people to stay on the trails or can you get off yep. and please get off we love that if you see a beautiful plant or bug or anything get off and explore it the one thing we ask is that you leave it there right right you know the right. old phrase is take pictures or memory you know and take memories and leave footprints but not take anything else right. that would be great but it's not a pick and garden correct <laughs> but we do speaking of that we have a great demonstration uh, butterfly garden right as you get there um, we love to um, learn and explore our local pollinators and plants, especially planting native ones. They help our birds in your own yard by planting native. So we have an area that you can see, it's all labeled with the plants of things that you could use in your own garden and uh, help the birds and the bugs as well. Well, I know that you are a bird nerd. I am. And we just talked about birds in your own yard. If I can't get out to Spring Creek, how, what can I do in my own yard to be able to encourage birds and pollinators? It's a great question. Um, we have a lot of information. The easiest thing is to just look up plants for birds and there's a database. You put your zip code in and it tells you what native plants to look for. Um, we have a lot of resources. So you can always contact us as well. We have some local botanists and um, nurseries that we know have native seed or native plants. Um, but like especially coming up right now in the fall, get them in before maybe mid-September. Um, is some fruiting shrubs. Shrub, shrubs with fruit are really great for those migratory birds that need that energy to get all the way to Mexico or South America. We've um, noticed a couple of hummingbirds have started to come back to our yard and so I've got my little feeders out and everything and That's which great. is exciting and we we have some plants like viburnum and mm -hmm. choke berry I think it's called yep. and stuff like that so which the robins seem to really like in my neighborhood. Yes so. robins, catbirds, thrashers right now right as they get ready to leave, they'll need to kind of bulk up and really get all those sugars and extra protein, so they will be loving those berries. Good, good. So let's recap. Why, why Spring Creek Prairie? Um, maybe, what is tall grass prairie? You hear about, sure. there's different kinds of prairies. So there's tall grass, short grass. Yep, tall grass prairie is the most eastern and central kind of upper plains area, uh, Ohio, Indiana kind of, and then this way. Nebraska is right on the edge of that, and so only in southeastern Nebraska okay. did you really have tall grass prairie. And how and tall is tall grass? Seven to eight feet, and then 15 feet of root underneath. It's a really amazing, like, whole 
biological e ecosystem in the tall grass prairie. It supports so much because of that. I mean, deer can walk right through it and you wouldn't see them. You know, we have bobcat out there. It's really amazing. Wow. So, and there's a whole world of nematodes and worms and bugs all in that soil and root system that that's their whole planet. Um, you move west and you start to get mixed grass and then especially short grass. That's where you uh, think of uh, especially the bison and the prairie dogs and black uh, footed ferret and all of that. They need that ecosystem out there. That's really exciting. Yeah. I, I just love the idea that we just have this, even though it's a tiny remnant, that we still have it in very close to Lincoln. And thank you to Audubon and Audubon members for supporting Spring Creek. Um, I would encourage our viewers to visit Spring Creek. It's really an interesting place. It's obviously not very expensive. It's very close to Lincoln. So thank you, Jason, the bird nerd, for being my guest today. Absolutely. And I'd just like to say, um, it's never too late to live and learn about our beautiful natural world. Are you 55 or older, low income and need a job? The Senior Community Service Employment Program offers employment assistance to low income Nebraskans age 55 and older, offering paid training at local organizations to update your job skills and build confidence, while preparing skilled, experienced and responsible older workers for today's workforce. The program also helps local agencies increase their services and operations. The recent tax bill had major implications for tax reductions in our income tax, but it also has some implications for charitable giving. My guest is Jim Cutchison from the Nebraska Community Foundation. And Jim, welcome. Thank you very much, Doug. Glad to be here. Let's. Uh, before we get into involved in the details, sure. uh, talk a little bit about your role at the Nebraska Community Foundation. Well, my role at the Nebraska Community Foundation is working with individuals and families all across our great state, helping them uh, give back to their communities and charitable organizations that are important to them. So you have direct contact with potential givers? Yes, uh, work directly with individuals and the families, also with their professional advisors, helping them to figure out what they want to do and how they want to do it and put a plan into place. Before we, again, before we get into the details, we want to have a little caveat here that you're not the tax expert, but, but we'll talk about the implications for charitable giving. Correct. I am not a CPA. I'm not an attorney. Uh, so we don't try to practice law or provide tax advice, but we do provide information for people to take to their advisors uh, that know a lot more about their situation and how the taxes would have some implications in their giving. We hear a lot about big gifts from maybe corporations and so on, but how much giving is actually done by individuals like you and me? Yeah. Well, it's really interesting. There's an organization called uh, Giving USA, and every year they do a study, and uh, we've got the chart up that shows that uh, surprisingly to many people, the vast majority of gifts made in the United States comes from individuals. In fact, over 70% of all charitable gifts are made by individuals to their charitable organizations. And a very small slice is given by foundations. Uh, it also shows bequest. That is a, a gift someone makes in their will or the beneficiary designation. Uh, that makes up another uh, good percentage. And then foundations uh, give also. And if you add foundations, bequests, and individuals together, uh, that far exceeds what uh, corporations give. So it's, again, just a great testimony to the generosity of Americans. And the interesting thing is those slices have stayed pretty consistent over time. What grows is the size of the pie that's being given to charitable organizations. One of the tools that is available through the, the tax bill is the IRA rollover. It's, it's been in existence for a little bit, but it mm -hmm. is going to continue. Uh, tell us how that works. Right. Yeah, the ability uh, you're talking about is for somebody that qualifies over age 70 and a half can distribute money directly from their IRA to charity, and they can do that tax-free. There's not a tax deduction involved with that process, but it's a tax-free, which in my mind is probably better than a tax deduction if you don't have to count it as income. Uh, so as you said, this law has been around for a while. Uh, Congress, a few years ago, made it as permanent as Congress can do. They did not put an expiration on it. And we find at the Nebraska Community Foundation and our affiliated funds, 
Uh, this is really popular with people. Uh, the other unique thing about one of the benefits, Doug, of this giving is that this gift to charity qualifies as the required minimum distribution from an IRA. And this is part of the tax law that when you reach 70 and a half, even if you don't want money out of your IRA, you have to take money. All right. So for many Nebraskans, this is a great way to do charitable giving, especially if they don't need that required minimum distribution. One, the other thing regarding the tax bill that's, I think, really important is the standard deduction was, was increased, actually doubled, correct? Yes. Yep. So what are the implications there for, for giving? Right. Yes, the standard deduction is doubled for both those filing jointly and also for individuals uh, filing single. Uh, boy, there was a lot of doom and gloom predicted uh, late last year when the tax law was uh, passed that charitable giving was going to cease because people may not be able to actually take a deduction for their gift because of that higher limit of 24000 for a married couple, for example. Uh, but to date, we've not really seen much change at the Nebraska Community Foundation and people's giving habits. Uh, and so we're really cautiously optimistic that there will not be much change at all. Uh, the other thing I always reflect back on is uh, studies that have done asking people why they make charitable gifts. And surprisingly, tax deduction is very low on the list. People give to their favorite charitable organizations, their hometown, their place of worship, because they believe in that. They have a passion for that, and that's why people give. Um, so tax deductions, I find, may help people motivate them to do it, but again, nobody's making money by getting a tax deduction. It's out of the passion and kindness of their hearts that they do these I suppose people acts. could sort of bunch things up, you know, maybe this year and not next year. Is that is that a... A little strategy there. Yes, that's a strategy that's been talked about by uh, professional advisors and the idea of bunching not only your charitable giving but perhaps prepaying your real estate taxes. And so in one year you're having a larger amount of these deductions to get above the new standard deduction. And then the next year, since you prepaid, you just take the standard deduction. And so that is a strategy that's being talked about quite frequently. Another strategy is to set up a donor advisor fund. Tell us how that works. Yes, a, a donor advised fund is a um, charitable giving tool that is offered by many charitable organizations, in particular community foundations. And what a donor advised fund allows a donor to do, such as yourself, Doug, is you can make a gift this year. And let's say you are bunching your donations, so you bunch them into a donor advised fund. Uh, you get to take the tax deduction in this year under current law with a donor advised fund, there's no requirement that you have to distribute that. So you can again bunch your gifts in one year with a donor advised fund and then make the recommendations to make the grants to your favorite charitable organizations over the next couple of years and then you can bunch again and then do the okay. same thing. Okay. Another thing we should discuss is, is um, beneficiaries, both in terms of regular, you might say, financial accounts and also in, in wills. Right. And, you know, is this, is this something that, that people ought to be thinking maybe more about? I sure think so. <laughs> uh, again, the ability to give when, no one, when you don't need those assets is a popular way for people to give. And typically you don't need those assets at your death or at the death of your loved ones. And so that makes an ideal time to do some charitable gifting. Uh, there's lots of benefits to doing this type of gifting. Uh, when you make a gift in your will, it's called a bequest. Uh, it's something called a revocable gift, so you have the opportunity to use those assets during your lifetime if you need them. You have the opportunity to change your mind if you want to, uh, but you can make an intention today to make a gift in the future at the end of your lifetime. Uh, so this is a very popular way for people to make gifts. Uh, again, the ability to retain control of your assets during your lifetime is very important to people because oftentimes we don't know how much it's going to take to uh, care for ourselves or our families. So to do this, you need to usually visit with an attorney, either draft a new will and put that gift in there, or if you have an existing will, you can do something that's called a codicil. It's simply a change to your existing will and you include the charitable beneficiary at that time. We maybe should remind people of the, the kinds of assets that you're referring to here. Sure. 
So uh, with a will, you can make a gift, but also there are certain types of assets that you can do beneficiary designations with. And those beneficiary designations would pass outside of the will. And so those type of assets would be some financial accounts. Uh, so at, at a bank, you may have a certificate of deposit. Uh, could be a savings or checking account. Uh, mutual funds also pass this way. These are often called payable on death. That's what the POD stands for. And so you could simply go in, do a beneficiary change, and name your favorite charitable organization either as the first beneficiary or as the second beneficiary. Many of us are familiar with life insurance, has a beneficiary, and for many people using life insurance that's no longer needed is a popular way to do some charitable gifting. So you could either have the beneficiary be your spouse, or if you have that policy that you no longer need, that you bought when you were raising your family, uh, you could name charity as a beneficiary on that. We talked earlier about IRAs. Uh, many people I work with find uh, their families do not need those IRAs at their death, and they find they have this double taxation, all that tax deferred growth, uh, the taxes on that come due at death when it goes to your family. And so if you have some charitable interest, IRAs or annuities are very popular to give to charity because in the hands of charity, a tax-exempt entity, there's no taxes paid on that. Jim, we, we uh, ought to mention uh, possible uh, charities here, and including the sponsor of this program, Aging <laughs> Partners, is, is uh, another charity that people might uh, think about. As well. Exactly. Yeah, uh, Aging Partners would be a wonderful place to help support this type of programming and all the other wonderful things they do. I know across Nebraska, I've been fortunate to work with a couple of people uh, in Fremont with uh, er the aging agencies have different districts across the state. Uh, somebody has included in their will a gift to the, the Fremont. And then just in the last few months in Red Willow and Dundee County in southwest Nebraska, worked with an individual that really appreciated the services her parents received. And so she has included a gift in her will to benefit the, the programs and services provided there. Jim, just sort of as a, as a summary, what are the kinds of questions that you get most often when people are considering mm -hmm. charitable giving? Well, typically, Doug, they deal around uh, the question of how much and how do I do this? Uh, and the question of how much is, again, is, is an individual response. Uh, everybody is in a different situation, so you need to look at what your resources are and what you need. Uh, but a couple of ideas I usually share with people is uh, kind of that uh, biblical idea of tithing. Uh, perhaps think about 10% of your assets to, to leave to your favorite charitable organizations, your, your place of worship, your hometown. Another idea that my wife and I kind of really uh, looked at and thought about is uh, we have three children, grown on their own, doing well. And when we said, well, what if we were to add a fourth child, being our favorite charitable organizations, and huh. divided our estate four ways, and you looked at those numbers, we saw, boy, our kids aren't going to give up a whole lot, but we're able to do some good for our favorite charitable organizations. And so that is often a concept people like of adding a child being your favorite charitable organization That's to your estate. Very plan. interesting concept. It is. Uh, well, Jim, it, it seems to me that uh, a person like yourself, um, an accountant, an attorney, uh, and uh, our form a team to, to help you sort of think through this. Oh, exactly. I really encourage us when I'm working with individuals and families to sit around the table just like this and bring in their advisors uh, because usually I just get one narrow look at somebody, uh, what they own and what their estates are, whereas they've had a long time relationships with an attorney or accountant or a financial advisor, an insurance agent. And so I think much better advice can be given, better decisions can be made, and better coordination to make sure all of this is working together. Because uh, the worst thing that would ever happen is if uh, you're doing making planning and it, it affects the overall plan. I've had situations where people have not done that type of coordination. It just doesn't work as well, or they don't feel as satisfied in what they've done. Jim, this has um, been very interesting. Thanks a lot for your insights here. It's, you're there's a lot of potential there. Lots of things to think about and welcome this opportunity to share. Remember, it's never too late to live and learn.